Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you for being Shabbat here Shabbat. on this Shabbat so we can study together the Torah portion of today, which is called Shelach Lecha, Shelach Lecha, which means basically send for yourself. Send for yourself, and it's found in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 41. But before we start, I would like to say the blessing for the Torah portion. It says like this. Baruch ata Adonai Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu Bemitzotav Etzivanu La Asog Vedivre Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with your commandments and commanded us to engage ourselves in the words of the Torah. So, as I was saying, it's, our Torah portion is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 41. And it reads that today I'll be using the uh, Tree of Life version of the Holy Scriptures. And it says, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, send some men on your behalf to investigate the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. But if you go to Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy, verse 1 through 22, I mean, chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, it says that the people asked Moses to send out men to look at the land. So here it sounds like it's the Lord is asking Moses, but really it was the people that asked Moses and Moses thought it was a good idea. And so then he shares it with, with the Lord and the Lord says, okay, sure. But we know that it really wasn't uh, the Lord's intention that they do that because he already had promised them that the land was going to be like a land of, milk and honey flowing with milk and honey that they were that they're going to be able to conquer all the nations and that he's going to be with them so basically uh it's kind of like when the people told samuel they wanted a king and samuel got upset about it and the lord said hey let them they want a king give them a king and they'll see what's going to what's going to happen with that so the same thing in that sense is happening with this issue about going into the land to look at it so it says, each man you are to send will be a prince of the tribe of his fathers, a man from each tribe. So they're going to send someone that's considered a prince. So basically, they're going to use social status in deciding which men are going to go and represent every tribe and go see the land. And another thing, sometimes maybe your Bible says spies. They really weren't spies. That's a, not a very good translation. Because in the Hebrew, the word it um, basically means to send out explorers, to send out people to get gather information, not really to spy on them. Verse three. So according to the word of Adonai, Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All the men were princes of the children of Israel. Again, uh, emphasizing that these men were men that were respected and honored within the tribe, which meant that when they come back with whatever report they're bringing, the people are going to believe them. Verse four, these are their names. And so it goes through all the tribes. And the one that I'm interested in, it goes through Reuben to Simeon. And then in verse six, it says from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, son of Yefune. So that's important that from Judah comes Caleb. Then we have Issachar, um, Ephraim from the tribe of Ephraim. We have Hoshea, son of Nun. So these two individuals are the most important of all 12 of them. And then we have from Benjamin, Zebulon, Manasseh, Dan, Asher, Naphtali, God, or Gad. In verse 16, it says, these are the names of the men Moses sent to investigate the land. Now he gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. So we have that he says in verse 16 that he, Moses, he gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. Now, unfortunately, in English, we're not going to get what it means because in the Hebrew, Hoshea means salvation. Hoshea, the way it's written in Hebrew means salvation. But when he changes his name, what he's adding is the letter Yod or Yud to the name Hoshea. And it's going to say now Yehoshua. So he's going from Hosea to Yehoshua, which unfortunately is translated as Joshua. 
Yehoshua means God will save. So he goes from salvation, the name salvation, to the name that God will save. And the reason he does this is that he's adding the letter Yod, which is like in Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. It's the only leader of the princes of all the tribes that has the letter Yod in his name. And the purpose is that Moses knows already as being a prophet that he's trying to make sure that nothing happens to Joshua, that nothing happens to Yehoshua. And it's also we need to see the correlation with Yeshua himself. Why? Because it is, we know that Joshua is the one that's going to bring the people into the land, into the promised land. And it is through Messiah that we come into the kingdom. It is through him. So in this, that sense, uh, the name Joshua or Yehoshua is related to Yeshua. Not only that, uh, I've read before that the name Yeshua is like a, a short way of saying Yehoshua. But then again, it has to do with salvation. That is why it's important that when we say the name of our Savior, we use the name Yeshua, preferably over Jesus. Not that Jesus is wrong. It's just that by saying Yeshua, we're always proclaiming salvation, what he came to do and continues doing. Verse 17. As he sent them to explore the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up there through the Negev. And the Negev is the most southern part of the land of Israel. Go up there through the Negev, then go up into the hill country. Verse 18, see what the land is like and the people living there, whether they might be strong or weak, few or many. In what kind of land are they living? Is it good or bad? Also, what about the cities in which they are living? Are they unwalled or do they have fortifications? How is the soil, fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So he's let, they're letting us know this kind of towards the end of spring. This is the time they're going because it's starting already the fruit of the land to flourish. And so there is kind of probably the end of spring. Verse 21 of chapter 13. So they went up and explored the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, the entrance of Hamat. They continued on up through the Negev and came to Hebron. Now I have to remember that Hebron is where um, Abraham, his wife, and his uh, sons were, met, uh, were buried there, where the, we have the cave of Machpelah. There lived Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, descendants of Anak. Now, maybe some of your translations say giants. And the thing is that the this, this, uh, descendants of Anak, they were known because they were very, very tall. As a matter of fact, the name Anak means neck. So probably these individuals are tall, so they had long necks also. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Verse 23, when they reached as far as the Valley of Eshkol, they cut a single branch with a cluster of grapes. It was carried on a pole between two of them. So that means how big these clusters of grapes, how the fruit of the land was very big. And, till, and still to today, when you go to Israel and you, and you taste the, the fruit and the produce, the produce and the fruits over there are truly big. I'm sure they're not as big as they used to be, but when you compare them to what we have here in the States, they're big. So it says it was carried in a pole between two of them. They also cut some pomegranates and some figs. And this lets us know that it's already, it's already close to the end of summer because usually around August, we start seeing this type of produce in the land. So remember that they're there 40 days. So it's basically the end of spring and starting sometime in the summer or towards the end of summer. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because the cluster, because of the cluster cut by the children of Israel. They returned from investigating the land after 40 days. They traveled and returned to Moses, Aaron, and an entire community of the children of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. And we have to understand when they mentioned Kadesh, Kadesh is, they were at a point basically that to get into the promised land was very close. They were basically near, they were right there. All they had to do was cross over a little bit and get into the land. So Kadesh is very important because by the time we finish the book of Numbers, we'll see they'll go back right to that point again. 
So they were Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They gave their report to them and the entire assembly. They showed the land's fruit. They gave their account to him and said, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. This is some of its fruit. So remember, they show their fruit is huge. Except the people living in the land are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the sons of Anak there. So their impression is that the people are very powerful. They're tall, but then again, when we read before, it just mentions only three descendants of Anak. And here they're saying, they're kind of making the sound that all the people are tall. Okay, so you, you have to understand that some of the things they're gonna be saying doesn't make any sense because at one point it mentions only three descendants of Anak, which are the tall people. And now they say basically what they're saying is everybody is huge and they're tall. Also in verse 29, it says, I'm a, Am Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites are living in the mountains. And the Canaanites are living near the sea and along the bank of the Jordan. In other words, all these nations we know that eventually are going to be enemies of Israel, especially Amalek. Verse 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should definitely go up and capture the land for we can certainly do it. So Caleb, remember that Caleb Again, he's from the tribe of Judah. And I don't know if you know that the term Caleb as a term, Kalev in Hebrew means dog. And it's not in the bad sense, but Kalev, if you break down the word in Hebrew means like a dog in the sense, those of you that have, have had dogs, pets, you know that they're very faithful and very loyal. So in that sense, the name Caleb or Kalev is related to that faithfulness and that loyalty because Caleb, is faithful to the promise that the Lord gave them. But the men who had gone up with him said, we cannot attack these people because they are stronger than we. They spread among the children of Israel a bad report about the land they had explored saying, the land through which we passed to explore devours its residents. This also doesn't make any sense because they're saying first, that we can't attack these people because they're stronger than we are, but yet the land is eating them up. So are they really strong? If they were that strong, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be devoured by the land. So that also doesn't make any sense. And another thing is by speaking badly about the land, they're speaking against a gift that the king Hashem has given to them. They're basically rejecting the gift of the land that comes from the king. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had the, uh, the experience that you have a gift for someone and maybe it's cost you a lot of money or maybe you made it yourself and you give it to the person, the person's like, ooh, you know, it, it, it hurts. So imagine what it means to the father. He has given this beautiful land to the, his people and they're rejecting it. They're talking bad about it. Which basically they're talking bad about the king. All the people we saw there are men of great size. We also saw there the Nephilim. The sons of Anak are from the Nephilim. So remember that the term Nephilim, again, I've said this before and I'll say it, say it again. Nephilim are not fallen angels that has sex with humans, with women. That is a lie, that is untrue, that is a, a misinterpretation of the context of the word in Genesis. Nephilim were just some people that were very tall. They probably had a genetic defect. They probably were uh, what's called acromegaly. These are people that grow very tall and their bones are very, um, a little bit deformed. So they, they look very uh, frightening, some of them. And so they're huge, they're really huge. And so therefore most likely these descendants, these people had some sort of genetic defect and that's why they were very tall. And when it says Nephilim, Nephilim comes from the, from the root word Nafal, which means to fall. And one of the understandings is that when people saw them, they fell, they felt uh, frightened. They felt like they were very small before these people. So it's not, it has nothing to do with fallen angels. That is uh, the, the most absurd thing that you can really hear. There's a lot of myths, there's a lot of legends, but I assure you it has nothing to do with fallen angels. Why? Because 
you would be speaking against God as creator because God knew what he was doing and there's no way, no way angels can have sex with women. They're two complete species different. It's like if you try to marry, a, have a mate, a cat with a dog, there's no way. Species like that cannot be mixed. So therefore there's no way angels can mix with humans. If you believe that, then you are calling, calling the creator a liar that he doesn't know what he did. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so another term for them was that they were, they were big people, very tall, very tall. And then they say, we seemed like grasshoppers in our eyes as well as theirs. How do they know what they were thinking? So again, what is the issue with these men that speak against the land and frighten the people? When you go back to the word that is used to say scout or spy in Hebrew, it gives you the sense that they were seeing with their heart. In other words, what was in their heart, they already had a bad feeling about the land. They weren't very happy of going into a land, especially they're in the wilderness and they're being taken care of, of everything. They, they complain about water, they got the water. They complain about food, they got the manna. They complain about the manna, they got the... the uh, the, um, uh, the, the meat that came, you know, all this stuff. So every time they complain, they got what they wanted. But here, that means they would have to go to the land. They have to work for it. They have to fight for it. It's going to be a different game, a different uh, see, a change of environment. And now it's gonna, they have to start doing the work. So already what it means when they, these men went in to explore the land, they already had made up their mind that this was not gonna work. And so that's why the word that they use in the Hebrew, which is the word sur, it's the same word that at the end of the Torah portion, when it talks about the zitzit, that it says that they're there to remind you so you don't stray after your heart or after your eyes is the same word they're using for these guys. Because they already had preconceived ideas. And so they went with that. They couldn't see anything else because that was was already in their heart and that's what they wanted to see because you got 12 guys 10 see bad stuff all negative and two of them agree with the word that the lord had already spoken to them chapter 14 all through that night the entire community raised up their voices the people wept all the children of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole community said so what's going on these negative people have influenced negatively the whole community to the point that they're crying, that they're sad, that they're afraid. And they start grumbling against Moses and Aaron. And they start saying, if only we had died in Egypt, if only we had died in this wilderness, why is Adonai bringing us to this land to fall by the sword? And we know that's not the purpose that why God is bringing them into the land. Our wives and children will be like plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? This is how scared they were and how influenced they were by these men that they're ready to go back to Egypt. There's nothing there to go back to. I mean, they were slaves. They were, they were worth nothing. And God had already given them the Torah. God already has, has called them his people, has given them their name, has given them identity, has given them honor, has given them every, all their needs, has protected them. And here they're despising everything just because these 10 guys frightened the whole group. They said to each other, let's choose a leader and let's go back to Egypt. They're willing to get rid of Moses and Aaron and start all over again with a different individual and go back. Instead of moving forward, they want to go back. So that's why one thing we need to learn is when you're around negative people, it's not good. It's not good. You can't just always be in the negative. You have to see the bright side, especially if the Lord has given you a word and his word is about life. It's not about going back. It's always about progress. It's about moving forward. It's about gaining. Anyway, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. Why? Because they knew what was coming. They humbled themselves before the entire assembly of the community of the children of Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes as a sign of mourning 
as a sign of pain because they couldn't believe what the people weren't saying. Another thing that the commentaries say about this moment that this happened is that it was the ninth of Av. And if you remember the ninth of Av, both temples were destroyed. So this is a day that has to do with, with bad things happening to the people of, people of Israel. Because some, one of, some of the commentaries say is that since these people didn't really have a reason to cry and to grumble, then on the ninth of Av, God established those are going to be the days of mourning, of true crying and mourning because of the destruction of the temples. Verse 7, they said to the whole assembly of the children of Israel, the land through which we pass is an exceptionally good land. If Adonai is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land and will give it to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Only don't rebel against Adonai and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They will be food for us. The protection over them is gone. Adonai is with us. Do not fear them. So here we have Caleb and, and Joshua trying to encourage the people, reminding them that the Lord is with them, that the promise that the Lord gave them about the land. And he says, hey, we can do this. Verse 10, but the whole assembly talked about violently stoning them. They were ready to kill them. Can you imagine? Then the glory of Adonai, his visible presence, his Shekhinah, appeared at the tent of meeting to all the children of Israel. Adonai said to Moses, how long will these people treat me contemptly? How long will they neglect to trust in me? In other words, this is the issue with these people that came out of Egypt. And in spite of all they saw, in spite of all the experience they had, they still did not trust the Lord. So my question to you today is, look back in your life. How many times has the Lord saved you from death, from illness, from an accident, for things you didn't even know? How many times has he protected you, has provided for you, has been there for you? So why some people, at the, you know, after all these things, once something happens, a negative influence, and they completely start, stop trusting in the Lord? The Lord never fails. We fail. The Lord is loyal and faithful. He's faithful to the covenant that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why should we not trust what's written in his word and his promises? There's nothing here in the Bible that you can find that shows that God has not been able to ever do what he has said he's going to do. So how long will they neglect to trust in me in spite of all the miracles and signs I have performed among them? I will strike them with the plague. I will destroy them. But you, I will make into a nation greater and stronger than they. So this is a covenant lawsuit. Why? Because of the covenant in Mount Sinai. And they're speaking against the covenant. They're speaking against the king. They're speaking against the land. They're not trusting a loyal, faithful king. And so now the Lord has the legal right to destroy them with a plague. That is a covenant lawsuit. He's going, he's using his legal power, his authority to be able to do this. Moses said to Adonai, the Egyptians will hear about it because you brought up this people by your power from among them. They will tell the residents of this land about it. Already they have heard that you, Adonai, are in the midst of this people, that you, Adonai, have been seen eye to eye, that your cloud remains over them, and that in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, you go before them. If you kill these people all at once, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, because Adonai was unable to bring these people to the land he had promised them, he has slaughtered them in the wilderness. So what is Moses doing? He's trying to protect the honor of Hashem. He's reminding him of his reputation among the nations. At this point, from Egypt forward, all the nations in Canaan have heard about what Hashem, the God of Israel, has done for them. So if he, if he kills them all, what the people and the nations are going to say is, you see, he's like any other God. He's not that powerful. He's not that strong. He's not any different. So Moses says, if you do this, you're going to lose your honor. People, are, the nations are going to see you like any other God. So remember, 
Verse 17, so please let Adonai show his strength just as you have spoken saying. Adonai is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Remember that loving kindness is a legal term of the covenant. Is the word chesed in Hebrew. Forgiving iniquity and transgression, still he does not leave the guilty and punish, bringing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. Forgive now the guilt of this people in accordance with the greatness of your chesed, your loving kindness according to your covenant, just as you have pardoned this people from Egypt until now. So he's trying to convince the Lord by telling him about his reputation. And number two, reminding him of his attribute of mercy, his attribute of mercy and loving kindness because of the covenant. So what happens? Verse 20, Adonai answered, I have forgiven them just as you have spoken. But in other words, instead of killing everybody like he was thinking about doing, he kind of lowered the punishment a little bit. But as certainly as I live, which is a, a, an oath formula, to say as I live is an oath, it's an oath formula. But as certainly as I live and as certainly as the glory of Adonai fills the entire earth, none of the people who saw my glory and my miracle and signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet tested me these 10 times and did not obey my voice, not one of them will see the land I promised to their forefathers. So in other words, instead of killing the whole nation and trying to make another one with Moses, he says, I'm just going to get rid of those that have not believed, that in spite of all they have seen, they still don't believe, that has spoken against me. None of those who treated me with contempt will see it. However, my servant Caleb, because a different spirit is with him and he is wholeheartedly behind me, I will bring him into the land where he went. His offspring will inherit it. So when he says it's a different spirit, what he's saying is that, that, that Caleb, Caleb believed what God had promised. He believed in the promise of the land. He believed in the promise of a land with flowing milk and honey. So he believed and was faithful and loyal to that word. So that's why he said there was a different spirit in him compared to the other men. Now, since the Amalekites and Canaanites are inhabiting the valley, turn back tomorrow and set out by the wilderness route toward the Sea of Reeds. So remember, they're in Kadesh. They're very close to crossing the border, the frontier to go into the land of promise. And now the Lord says, go back. Start going back from where you came. Instead of moving forward, he's making them go back. Why? Verse 26 of chapter 14. Adonai then said to Moses and Aaron saying, how long will this wicked community be grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel grumbling against me. So tell them, as surely as I live, again, an oath formula, says Adonai, I will do to you just as I heard you say in my ears. Remember, they were saying, oh, why didn't we die in Egypt? Why are we going to die here in the wilderness? In this very wilderness, your bodies will drop. Every one of you, 20 years of age and older, who was numbered in the census and grumbled against me. Remember the census when the men 20 years and older were counted for military purposes. So apparently all these guys agreed with the 10 spies or the, the 10 men that spoke bad about the land. So these, all these men are going to die except Caleb and Joshua. Not one of you will enter the land about which I lifted my hand to make home for you, except Caleb son of Yefune and Joshua son of Nun. So basically, sometimes we've had the impression that all the people that came out of Egypt died. It wasn't all the people. It was the men that were 20 years and older that were counted for military service. They went along with the 10 that spoke bad about the land. But the people that were younger than 20, they survived, they made it, and the children that were born in the desert. And for example, the Levites, they made it and other people made it. Okay, so it's not everybody that died that came from Egypt that died in the wilderness. As for your children, 
whom you said would be like plunder, I will, I will bring them in and they will experience the land that you spurn. But your bodies will drop in this wilderness. Your children will be herdsmen in the wilderness for 40 years. They will suffer because of your unfaithfulness until your corpse are consumed in the wilderness. For 40 years, corresponding to the number of 40 days, you explored the land one year for each day. You will suffer for your iniquities and know my hostility. I, Adonai, have spoken and certainly will I do this to all this wicked community banding together against me. In this wilderness, they will meet their end and there they will die. That's the punishment. Instead of eliminating everybody, he's just going to eliminate those that were 20 years and older, counted in the census, that spoke and believed the bad report from the land. Then the men whom Moses had sent to explore the land, who had returned and caused the whole community to grumble against him by spreading a bad report about the land. These men spreading the bad report about the land died of the plague in Adonai's presence. So a, a, a plague came about and killed all these 10 men, those that initially went in to explore the land. So they were killed immediately. While the rest of the people, they have to wander for 40 years until all those that God said had to die would die and would not go into the promised land. Of those men who had gone to explore the land, only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, survived. When Moses related this, these things to the children of Israel, the people mourned bitterly. In other words, maybe they repented or maybe they, they, they felt like, well, maybe we should have listened to Caleb and Joshua. So the thing is, now they're mourning, now they're crying, now they're regretting. So what happens? They rose the next morning and went up to the high mountain saying, look, let's go up to the place which Adonai promised for we have sinned. So now they're ready to go into the land. Because remember where they're at. It was just going up the mountain a little bit and into the promised land. Verse 41, but Moses said, why are you disobeying the mouth of Adonai? That will never succeed. You should not go up because Adonai will not be among you and you will be defeated before your enemies. For the Amalekites and Canaanites are there in front of you and you will fall by the sword. Adonai will not be with you because you turned away from following Adonai. In other words, if God is not with you, you cannot conquer what he said you're going to conquer. But these people, they're still disobedient. They're still doing their own thing. They think that now, okay, they've kind of sort of repented. Let's go in because now and God said, eh, sorry, if you guys go, you go by yourself and you're going to get beat up because you did not believe what I said, but believe the 10 men that went to explore the land. But presumptuously, verse 44, they went up to the high mountain country, though neither the Ark of Adonai's covenant nor Moses moved from within the camp the ark and go which represents the presence in the throne of God and Moses who's the leader they he didn't go either the Malachites and Canaanites living in the mountain country came down attacked them and beat them down all the way to Hormah and Hormah in Hebrew means destruction so basically there was destruction there was death they were beaten again. Why? Because God said, don't go now. There's, there's no, you're going to have to turn back. Don't try to go into the land now because none of you are going to survive to make it to the, into the land. You need, all of you are going to die. That is the punishment for not believing and not trusting my word, but believing those that gave a bad report. So chapter 15, it says, again, spoke... Again spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land that I am giving you where you will make your homes. So this is saying again that they will go into the land, the children, those that believed, those that did not murmur against the land, those that did not believe the bad report, those will go into the land. So by saying this, now he's going to be speaking about offerings. He's assuring them, he's giving them the hope that they will make it 
to the land. So when you enter the land that I'm giving you where you will make your homes and you're presenting a fire offering to Adonai, a burnt offering or sacrifice to mark fulfilling a vow, a free will offering or during Moadim or a festival to present a pleasing aroma to Adonai from the herd or from the flock, the one bringing the offerings to present a grain offering of a tenth of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with a fourth of hen of oil. So he's going to give some instructions about offerings, that every time an offering is of an animal is brought, it has to be accompanied by mincha, which is the flower offering, oil, and the libation offering, which is wine. So depending on the number of animals and the type of animals is going to be the amount of flour, of oil, and of wine. So he's explaining this. And then depending also on certain uh, offenses, if it's the community or if it's individual. And you have to remember that these offenses are involuntarily. It's not it's something that happens that is you haven't, uh, you're not doing it willingly. It's something that happens. And so you, you bring an offering because remember that for unintentional sins is when you can bring an offering. If it's intentional, there were no offerings for that. So he goes into explaining these things, which was in a way we already have spoken of in the book of Leviticus. Please go to verse 13 of chapter 15. It says, everyone native born is to do these things like so when bringing a fire offering as a pleasant aroma to the night. Whenever an outsider resides with you, in other words, someone that is not an Israelite, but joins the people of Israel, which means they come into covenant and they accept the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whenever an outsider resides with you or whoever is among you for your generations to come, and he is to present a fire offering as a fragrant aroma to the night as you do, he must do it exactly the same as you are doing. The community will have the same rule for you as well as the, for the resident outsider. So an outsider that becomes part of Israel has to, has to do exactly the same as the native Israeli. In other words, there's no difference when serving the Lord. It will be a lasting statute throughout your generations. As for you, so for the outsider will it be before Adonai. The same Torah and the same regulations will apply to both you and the outsider residing among you. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel, say to them, when you enter the land to which I am taking you and you eat some of the food of the land, you are to offer a portion to Adonai, that is first fruits. You are to offer a cake from the first of your ground up meal as an offering for your threshing floor. So you are to lift it up. Here in this translation doesn't um, say it very well, but when you look it into the Hebrew, it's talking about challah. Remember that the bread that we use on Shabbat is called challah. But it's called hala in remembrance of this commandment, which, me, which really means that the person that is preparing the dough to make the bread takes a portion out of that dough as a first fruit. And that portion, when the temple was ex existed and even the Mishkan, that portion was given to the priest because that's the first fruit of that dough. And once that dough, you baked it, then after taking out that portion, then you could eat the bread, but before, but not until that portion was taken out. That's the first fruit. Today, there's no temple. And some women that make, and men too, because men can make the bread. But today, most Jews, they separate a portion of that bread, which is that little portion is called a challah. And many of them, they just burn it. They burn it but, because they don't have a temple to take it to or priests to take it to. But some people still do that. But remember that the, the uh, commandment was to take that portion of that dough before baking, that portion belongs to the Lord. And so that was taken and given to the priest. It says verse 21, throughout your generations to come, you are to give this offering from the first of your ground up meal. So this is challah. Okay. Verse 22, now we're going to see the difference between unintentional sin and a, an intentional sin. It says the different offerings depending, remember that for unintentional sins, you could bring offerings, but for the intentional one, you cannot. And so the case study, the example that they use about a defiant 
individual rebellious that intentionally does something wrong is the following. Verse 30 of chapter 15. But the person who sins defiantly, whether native or outsider, rebels against Adonai, and that person is to be cut off from his people. The word in Hebrew is karet. Remember that that is divine judgment. The Lord takes upon himself to punish this individual. And the understanding is that either that individual has a premature death or that individual doesn't have any children, no descendants, which in a way is, is like a death because no more generations for that individual. Verse 31, because he has despised the word of Adonai and has broken his commandment, that person will certainly be cut off. His guilt will remain on him. While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering wood on the Shabbat. So this is the example of someone intentionally doing something against the covenant, against the commandment, and especially against the Sabbath. Because he started gathering wood on Shabbat. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses, Aaron, and the entire assembly. They kept him under arrest, not being clear what was to be done to him. Why? Because they weren't sure if God himself was going to kill him or they, the people, were supposed to do it. So they're waiting to see what is the judgment of the Lord. Verse 35, Adonai said to Moses, the man has to die. In other words, profaning the Sabbath intentionally in a rebellious form. You say, I don't care, Shabbat, I'm going to do whatever I want. In that sense, the punishment is death. The whole assembly is to stone him with stones outside the camp. So the whole assembly took him outside the camp. They stoned him with stones. He died just as Adonai commanded Moses. So because of that, this is what follows. The Zitzit. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel, say to them, that they are to make for themselves zitzit on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. Maybe some of your translations say fringes. And we have to understand, first of all, that this was not unique to the children of Israel. Why? Because in the ancient Near East, usually priests or kings or wealthy people had fringes on their clothing. Why? Because that was a symbol of a status symbol. So the Lord is using it here to give a status, a special status to the children of Israel. It has to do with holiness. So he says to them that they are to make for themselves zitzit or fringes on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. And another thing, during this time, the people wore under their, their tunics or their clothing a special garment that had corners. And on that is where they attached the tzitzit to. And they are to put a blue cord on each tzitzit. Okay, so they talk about, some people say there were uh, eight fringes on each one. Other people say there were only three. But whether there were eight or three, it had to be also, you, they had to add a blue thread, which is called techelet in Hebrew. Is that special blue that they used also to make the tabernacle. And it was a very expensive dye that they had to use so they could, uh, they would use it on wool. And out of the wool, they would stain it with the, uh, uh, dye it with that techelet and it would be a special blue. It says, verse 39, it will be your own seed seed. So whenever you look at them, whenever you look at them, the purpose of this is to whenever you look at them, you will remember all the covenants of Adonai and do them and not go spying, which is the word that I was saying in the beginning is used, it's translated as scout. Some translated as spy. Is the word that means that you're looking with what's in your heart. You're not really seeing what's out there. You're looking with what is in your heart. So it says, again, you look at them. You will remember all the commandment of Adonai and do them and not go spying out after your own hearts and your own eyes, prostituting yourselves. Why prostituting? Because remember, it has if, if you do not, obey the commandment and you do whatever you want, you forget the commandment, you forget the covenant, 
and you do whatever you want because you had a, a desire in your heart, you saw it with your eyes, and you went and fell into that temptation or you went and made it in action. It's like adultery, but a spiritual adultery. It's idolatry by not obeying. So the purpose of the zitzit, that blue thread with the other fringes is that you look at it and that's going to help you remember all the commandment of the Lord and avoid you falling into that temptation. Avoid you falling into that sin. This way you will remember and obey because the term in Hebrew, zahar, which is translated as remember, really means to put that remembrance into action. It's not just remembering something, but it's remembering to do it. It's remembering to obey. This way you remember and obey all my commandments and you will be holy to your God. So the purpose of these zitziot, which is the plural of zitzit, because there's four of them, is to, by remembering and doing, it brings forth holiness. It's a status of holiness. I am Adonai, your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Adonai, your God. In other words, he says, because I brought you out of Egypt, I am your Elohim, you are my people, I can tell you that you need to do this. And again, there's always a controversy that, and I was just reading today in a commentary, there was one specific individual that, that said that Zitziot are only for men, that women, this is uh, what he said, women are not to wear them because they don't have the mind, the capacity to understand it. <laughs> I feel like going into that, this guy said that. Anyway, but there's here, when you look it up in the translation in the Hebrew, it's said in general terms. It says the children of Israel, all the people of Israel includes women. Women can use zitzit. They're not obligated, but it's not prohibited. It's a difference. One thing is something that is not obligated or something that is not prohibited. Okay, so it's not a prohibition for women, but the tradition and the customs that have come down through the ages, usually it's men, you see them wearing them. In Israel, you will not find women unless they're like Messianic women, or uh, I understand that um, the Ethiopian women use zitzi, zitziot. So therefore, it's not only for men. Women can use them. Why? Because it's a reminder of commandments, and women also have to follow the Torah. We also have to do the commandments. So if you have zitziot with you, you're wearing them, and something is tempting you, that zitzi is going to remind you, hey, think about it. Don't do it because it's not going to come out okay. So it's there for a reminder for us to help us maintain ourselves in a status of holiness. But women can wear them. Again, I myself in Israel will not wear them, not because I don't, I can't. It's just that because the culture there is unacceptable to women wearing zitzi. So therefore, out of respect, if I'm in Israel, I never wear zitzi. I usually use them here on Shabbat. When we're doing our Shabbat service, I wear a small tallit with my zitziot on. Why? Because it's a reminder of the, of, the, of the commandments. But again, it's not prohibited to women. We're just not obligated. And many of the reasons they give is, oh, because women are always with children and taking care of the house. And doing all the again, it's a mindset of that culture, an early mindset, because today as things have change many women are doing a lot of things like the men were doing so therefore there's there's no reason you cannot wear uh, zitzio the thing is if you wear them it's something to be worn always number two if a man wears a tzitzit is the custom in israel that you have to wear a kippah or you have to have a head covering men that wear zitzio have to have a head covering as a, a sign of respect to the father Okay, so with that, we finish the tour portion for today. We're going to take some time for any questions or comments.